I'd like to welcome everyone that is here today physically and virtually from YouTube, from Instagram, or wherever you guys are looking at us from at the annual UAE AI camp. Uh, of course, it's a, a program fully sponsored and uh, uh, encouraged from the National Program for the Artificial Intelligence by the UAE government. Uh, of course, I do work with Dubai Police for those who don't know, and I promise you I do not bite, so you guys can be as open as you guys want with me because in the end of the day, these are initiatives that we are doing for to, trans, to give knowledge and to transfer knowledge at least to uh, different uh, audience with us today physically and as well as virtually. Uh, again, there are no rules necessarily, so if you guys don't understand something, please feel free to ask any questions and interrupt me. You can scream, and if you don't like the show, you can throw some tomatoes. That is a joke, so this is the part where people tend to laugh. <laughs> uh, having said that, um, Again, our objective always is with these short courses, at least with one hour, is really more not to lecture you about the topic, but to open your ideas and mindsets for these topics. Uh, in the sense that it's very difficult, sorry, it's very difficult to, um, to, to pass a big, sword, a big amount of knowledge within a small span of time. I don't want to bore you with that. Uh, so. There's not really any slides today except for one or two websites I'm going to be opening later on. But again, more of just passing the real fundamental concept of the uh, content that we're talking today. So if you guys walk out, to, out of today with at least 10% or 5% of what's being discussed, that is a positive part. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of my background, so at least you guys uh, know what is the knowledge of where I'm bringing this knowledge from. So I hold a master's in digital currency and in blockchain. Sorry, I have to keep it closer. I hold a master's in digital currency and blockchain from the University of Nicosia. Uh, my research is virtual assets and virtual currencies. And I currently work in Dubai Police and I'm managing the aspects of uh, digital currencies at Dubai Police. Uh, how did I get into it is a really funny story. Uh, a few years ago, I remember, I got the first mining machines. If you guys have any idea, Mining machines were the devices used to mine or create bitcoins in the UAE about 2015, 2014, so quite a few years ago. And I recall when I first got the machine, nobody knew what it was. You know, everybody thought it was a server just to, you know, to store movies. And at that point, uh, I even brought it once to work, and people thought I was wasting time downloading movies at work. So I was telling them I was making research, and I'm trying to create money, and they really laughed at me saying that uh, it is impossible to create money. And I came up with this discussion saying there's Bitcoin and Bitcoin and Bitcoin and Bitcoin and they looked at me and laughed and laughed and laughed. Uh, that being said, there was a lot of interesting projects that were happening in the early 2015, 2016, just before uh, the era that we call today, which is like an over a trillion dollar market. Uh, projects that were like called Ethereum and other interesting technologies that were developed. Uh, so I had to remember I had requested um, our HR if I could go study a master's in uh, digital currencies and blockchain at the University of Nicosia for Khobras. And they looked at me and they're like, you want to study a master in digital currencies? And they're like, uh, I'm like, yes. And like, what will you do with it? I'm like, add knowledge and understand where this is, the future is going. And I remember very well the guys in HR were like, you know, if he's going to leave for 18 months, this is a very good idea how to get rid of him. So let's approve it and get rid of him for 18 months so we don't have any more of his headache. Uh, that being said, I came back after, and uh, that was about 2018, 2017, so the space where the crypto winter happened. <clears throat> anyway, not to bore you a lot with my story, but before we just jump into switching some uh, slides, I just want to give you guys an overall idea. And again, as interactive as you guys want to have or be, please feel free. Let me ask you guys a question, uh, of course. What was the first, before we understand Bitcoin, we need to understand something, what we call money or the creation of money. What was the first element of humans to create an exchange or store of value between us? Does anybody have any idea? A barter system. Does anybody know what's a barter system? 
So a barter system, for example, would be someone that says, you know, I'll give you one chicken for uh, a kilo of rice. Because at the time, there wasn't something called money. It was not created. So the barter system was used very, very uh, common in, in areas before, uh, what we call them before Christ anyways, at least. So for many, many thousands of years ago, uh, where they would, again, exchange items. So maybe I'll give you a land for 10 horses or whatever the barter system was. That was a system that was commonly used, but it was not efficient. Because the problem is you couldn't have change, right? So will really the value of four horses be the value of five chickens? If we compare it today, it would not be the case. So something, come with, something came up with the invention of coinage, or what we want to call actual, back at the time, at least we can say gold coins. So something a little bit like this. So at the time, they would create these gold coins, stamp them with, you know, the empires or state of empires of countries and says, I will buy you or pay you in an ounce, you know, not an ounce of gold, but I would buy your property for an ounce of gold or I would buy a certain, sorry. All right. So at the time they were like trading with gold coins, right? Gold and silver were a perfect item back at the time for them to trade these coinage. And of course, those are the uh, considered the assets or alternative assets that are we considered today as commodities. That being said, the only problem with that was if I wanted to travel from Dubai to Abu Dhabi and I wanted to take my wealth with me, I would have to carry bags and bags and bags of gold coins, which would be very heavy. So remember like those in the old Pirates movie, you would come with a trunk, you open them and you have a trunk of gold. That was not, again, efficient. So what would be a more efficient solution? Of course, the other reason is because people would steal these coins very easily. So, you know, if you store them in a safe, if you store them somewhere else, again, people can steal them. That being said, another methodology was developed, and it was called paper money. So what we use today, the concept of the paper money, you had the banks that were created, of course, with that. You had the banks storing your money, but then, of course, came digital banks where everything is now more or less digital, but still that money is still porn, uh, still uh, has a risk of being hacked, lost, or uh, devalued. So as you can see in many currencies or countries like uh, Zimbabwe, who knows Zimbabwe? Where's Zimbabwe? I'm checking your geography, guys. Thank you. So do you know what's the current biggest currency in, in, in Zimbabwe? No, but the Zimbabwe dollar. Do you know what's the biggest nomination they have? In Zimbabwe, they have bills, literally paper bills. It's written $100 trillion, Zimbabwe dollars, because of devaluation of their currency. And this is something that's similar that happened in uh, Lebanon recently. It also has happened recently in, in uh, Brazil also. So a few other countries where devaluation occurred. And it, please... Good question. So our concept of money today, and this is really builds the introduction for the argument of Bitcoin, um, is based on, well, traditionally it is based or backed by gold. But in 1973, money broke from the gold standard, so that's no longer the case. Uh, money today is based on international interest rate markets, on uh, treasury bills, uh, for those that currencies, for current, 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 uh, currencies that are pegged to the U.S. dollar. So there's about 138 uh, countries around the world that are pegged to the U.S. dollar. So whenever the U.S. dollar devalues, a lot of them devalues also with it. So there's that economic relationship between them, again, to facilitate trade, because, again, the U.S. dollar is a currency of trade globally. Uh, of course, now with China coming up, they want to change that balance of economies. But currency devalue for simple reasons. Um, war, for example, can be one specific case. Uh, political instability, uh, economic instability, uh, economic recessions, uh, lack of good financial policies from countries can cause a lot of these things to devalue. And of course, the most important one is unemployment rate. So the more people are unemployed, the more people don't have access to money, things become more expensive, and vice versa going on. So in 2009, and this again, I'm building the argument for Bitcoin. In 2009, a guy called Satoshi Nakamoto, 
It could be a woman. It could be an organization. It could be the CIA. It could be whatever conspiracy theory that you guys have heard of. We don't know. Decided to come up with something. A peer-to-peer -peer payment system called Bitcoin. Now, the idea that he created behind Bitcoin was in 2008, after the financial crisis of 2008, uh, do you guys still remember 2008 financial crisis? I'm getting too old, right? I'm still young. Uh, in 2008, uh, the financial crisis came up and a lot of banks and a lot of people lost money. So they said, all right, why, or Satoshi Nakamoto said, why do we always have to be relied or rely, we have to rely on banks for our financial system? Cannot we create a better concept that is more efficient and works in a better manner than the current the financial system that we use today? Why cannot we give power back to the people? Of course, he asked a very good question. But the problem with that question was, how do we give the power to the people and have an ecosystem that is going to work without a third party? Or in other words, how can I create a system of financial model, or sorry, financial system without having an issue for trust? Because trust is the biggest issue. And I'm gonna give you guys the example of that, but before I do that, I just wanna jump on, uh, hopefully the mic is clear. For the guys on YouTube, if the voice is good, I hope so. So if I go on Bitcoin example, if I just Google, oh, sorry. That's uh, it's the FA Auditorium. I hope it's clear also on YouTube. If not, you guys can just Google Bitcoin white paper and you'll find the same document. So imagine an entire industry of digital assets, of blockchain, of everything that we talk about today was built on this nine page paper document that discussed the ideas of transactions, timestamps, the ideas of creating a node, the concept of proof of work. Again, these are very technical terms. I don't want to go into them necessarily today, but if you guys are also interested for technical aspects of it, we can do specific classes for that. Um, networks and uh, incentives and reclaiming this. So all of this document, which is only nine pages, believe it or not, is what led to the creation of Bitcoin. And I tend to laugh with this because people think, you know, it required years of research. Well, it did require years of research, but this simple idea led to what is Bitcoin today. And of course, with all the technologies behind it that grew around it. So that was the idea of Satoshi Nakamoto. And in the first block he uh, had as a transaction, he put the date of 3rd January 2009 when the first Bitcoin was released was the date when the UK newspaper came out with the biggest uh, bailout for banks. So a kind of a, a revolt against the banking system. Of course, in the beginning, everyone thought that Bitcoin was a joke or it's still maybe a joke. Nobody took it seriously. Gamers used it in the early days, then criminals. Uh, and by the way, on a separate note, um, criminals and our aspect of feel are always the first adopters of new technology. Any new technology come out, the first adopters are always criminals because they try to commit their crime with the most innovative ways. So that happened also. And now today we have countries and banks that are adopting Bitcoin as a second reserve currency, such as Salvador, for example, recently. But it tells you the journey of Bitcoin in the last 10 years. And believe me when I say it, we're still in a very premature way on it. So it gives you the overall idea and the aspect of what is really the idea behind Bitcoin. It's, you know, it's, it's a really turning, fine, giving back individuals financial independency, uh, which is also important for them in today's world. Uh, that being said, if today we go into example, a website called coinmarketcap.com, for those that are on YouTube, you guys can type it directly. We have, and this is one of the most common websites, but there are others. We have over today almost 11,163 coins slash utility tokens slash projects in the crypto space. We have almost 400 exchanges that are accepting or trading cryptocurrencies. 
we have a market cap or a value in the market of almost $1.6 trillion with an average traded volume of $81 billion and a dominance of 45% and 20% uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So these numbers are huge. Imagine in 10 years only, 10 years, uh, 10 years only, from a person called Satoshi Nakamoto who created a Bitcoin, this small little idea of what we call coinage, to having a market size of $1.6 trillion. Nobody has ever done that. Nothing in history shows the growth or usability of such technology. So it says really that the users or interests are there. And I think the last time, I read, the, one of the recent reports I've read or research is about at least 200 million active wallets uh, that are using at least in cryptocurrencies. But of course, it doesn't mean that all the coins out there are legitimate coins because there's a lot of scams and, and it's important to have the awareness to understand and to be able to differentiate these projects. And this is maybe where I want to give you guys a little bit of an understanding on this aspect and some other resources and where you can make those differences happen and occur. Uh, for example, if we click now on Bitcoin, and I want to talk about the economic models of each project, for example. Uh, of course, and I refer to this website, so it's, I refer to this website because it's a good resource. But just for you guys generally, if tomorrow you guys want to look and research into specific projects, Example, here in Bitcoin, we know the coin, we know the market cap, you know, we know the trade volume of Bitcoin in the last 24 hours, and we also understand something very important, which is called the circulating supply. Now, why am I talking about circulating supply? And I'm not going to go maybe a lot into economics, but just to give you an overall idea. If something is limited, does the price go up over time or no? If something is unlimited and I can make so much of it at any time. Does the price will all go up or no? So when Satoshi Nakamoto came up with Bitcoin, one of the things that he designed in the coin, or at least in the protocol of the project, was to make Bitcoin limited in terms of its circulating supply. So there will only be 21 million uh, Bitcoins ever created or mined. And I think the last one will be mined in 20, sorry, in 2142. So in about 120 years, is the last Bitcoin is going to be mined. Of course, Moore's law, uh, we have almost 18.7 million Bitcoins in circulation uh, as of today. But uh, to have the last Bitcoin, ever mind, it will take us another 120 years. Sorry. Please. So uh, the question for those on YouTube, just for me to repeat it, is, or I'm giving her my. Uh, there are other mics, but I'm not sure if they're working. And um, there's also questions on YouTube, right? Can you read them out loud for me? So let me go on this concept. Does it work? Does it work? Is it working? Okay. That is working. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you please explain what do you mean by uh, mining a Bitcoin? Not a problem. I'm going to try to find a good picture. So let me put this example right there without going to. Uh, when we talk about mining a Bitcoin or we talk about creating the 21 million coins, the way how um, um, Bitcoin was created, it works on a blockchain which has multiple participants around the world that can contribute what we call hash rate or computing, oh, sorry, they can contribute hash rate and computing power. That computing power is provided by people that provide their computer power. So what we call ASIC miners, you could say. And they're similar to, and they're similar to these devices that you see everywhere on the internet. Now those that provide the hash rate or you can find also bigger companies that do it on a large scale. Uh, a lot of these by the way are located in China, for example. So, I mean, there's factory size and all of these. They all contribute to something called the hash rate. So let me give you guys an example. Uh, another great resource, by the way, is blockchain.info. So if I explore on uh, Bitcoin, which is this uh, area here, I can see that the current price, of course, is 38,000, and the estimated hash rate at the moment is about 103 EHS. 
and the amount of transactions is about 252,000. Transaction volume is about 2.3 million BTC traded and about transaction volume of 105. This data provides me, for example, if I go, I want to get you guys the hash rate. Sorry. If I can have oh, the hash rate. Okay. This provides me the total hash rate or the total amount of computing power that miners around the world are contributing to Bitcoin. This is what drives the economic model of Bitcoin. Now, the reason why we were able to produce 18 million Bitcoins in the first 10 years rather than the next 120 days is because of the network difficulty. So there's something called, let me see all time. Yeah, bingo. Uh, the network difficulty in Bitcoin, there's something called the concept of halving. Whenever miners reach a certain scale of hash rate over a period of time of production, the halving occurs, which means that the production unit of Bitcoin is dropped by 50% almost every four years. This is somehow to democratize the process or what Satoshi Nakamoto, in the sense that the technology will develop over time, Moore's law, right? So let me give you guys a simple example. You guys remember a floppy disk, right? A YAML floppy. How much was the size of a floppy disk? 16 megabytes, approximately. What is she? 16 megabytes, about like two, three songs back in the days. That was in the early 2000s, correct? 2003, 4. Today, what's the average or the biggest size of a USB stick? Over one terabyte. So the amount of how the technologies have developed in the last 10 years is the same concept of what we call the Moore's Law. The same thing that can be said for the hash rate. And you can see since 2009, it was very easy to mine Bitcoin. Back in the time, I could mine probably 50 Bitcoins a day. Did I keep them? No, I sold them. I know, my mistake. I would have been a richer person. That being said, around 2018, when we had, of course, the big price pumps, the hash rate or the network difficulty kept on increasing. As you can see, we're now at the lower difficulty network because we had a halving last year. Anytime there's a drop, the halving tends to drop. So we had one right about that phase. We had one in about 2017, 18, which is here. And then we had another recent one here. This democratizes the process or the production of Bitcoins through a miner. Does it make sense? I'm trying not to be technical. Uh, they are using artificial intelligence in a sense, if you can say, to mine today, but mostly it's self-programmed, so it can happen automated. And plus, now there's some a concept called proof of staking. So, have you guys all heard about the Ethereum London fork that's happening in the next few days? Did anybody read that in the news? So, Ethereum in the next few days will change its protocol from proof of work to probably an upgrade within proof of stake with upgrades on the network. Uh, the reason being said, because the problem with Ethereum today, if you want to, of course, let's say if I want to transfer one Bitcoin from you to someone else, there's a small fee that is taken. That fee is given to the miners. That's the reward for contributing hash rate or computing power to keep in that system. And by the way, there is no way to shut this down. If you get ever, if someone says, you know, Bitcoin can be shut down, the only way possible is that if the internet stops in the world, the entire internet globally stops which is near impossible. And even if it does, you just need one machine, just one machine in the world working and everything continues to work. So it's interesting how the system is set up. Sorry, your question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering when you say miners, are they like um, actual humans? Like, is it a person? So, uh, it could be anyone. It could be a company. We call them as miners. That's the slang of the, or the terminology that's being used in the industry. Uh, but of course, it, it's, it can be me, it can be you, it can be anyone in this room that can have just one device and mine uh, Bitcoin. I don't know. Have you ever seen a video how this works or no? Just out of curiosity. No. No, I don't think so. So this should me give you guys an idea. I'm also wondering what would a person need to like study or know in order to like be a miner? Bitcoin ASIC. I mean, if you have some basic knowledge on crypto, you have a lot of resources that can, that can are available online, but probably crypto farming, okay. 
So this person is probably mining Ethereum in his house. These are the devices that usually people would have on average. Again, this is just a video from YouTube, so disclaimer, uh, terms and conditions, or don't go by the same device. I'm not sure which brand it is. Uh, that being said, these are similar setups that people have in their apartments or houses. So they provide what we call GPU cards, and that produces a contribution of hash rate. Of course, this is such a small scale, but then you have the same people that are doing it on a much, much, much larger scale, which I can show you, for example, uh, and where I think there's some questions from YouTube. I'm just gonna answer that shortly. Bitcoin uh, farms, they usually call them if you want. So you can find them in China, probably. Uh, let me let's see if this is gonna open. I don't wanna go through all of this, but just to give you guys an idea. So you have, yeah, so you have people that literally have warehouses, big sized warehouses, sorry, where they're actually mining. And they're doing this on a commercial scale just to contribute power to the Bitcoin network. So of course for them, it does provide them a lot of revenues because they're getting rewarded for all of this. But you can find these devices or these miners everywhere in the US, China, Iceland, uh, on a commercial large scale. So and again, just popping a video on YouTube, disclaimers are there. Sorry, is there any questions from the YouTube channel? The hash rate. So the hash rate is, again, contributing the number of, uh, sorry, contributing, let me put it in simple form, contributing computing power for the network to hold uh, for the blockchain of Bitcoin. So if you guys go on blockchain.info, you'll find the number of hash rate, uh, or at least the total distribution of hash rate between the biggest pools. So here you can see that the biggest uh, pools on uh, on uh, on uh, the hash rate distribution is Ant Pool, which is owned by a company called Bitmain. It's Chinese, and of course you have the F2 Pool, which is Chinese slush pool, which is also Chinese, and then you have all the others uh, over there. Now the fees per turns. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah, hi. Um, when is it ever better to be a part of a pool, a mining pool, than be mining by yourself? All right. So usually it's very difficult for someone to mine by himself. You could do it. I'm not saying it's not difficult. But what I mean is the probability of you getting rewarded is going to be less if you mine by yourself. So everyone tends to put their computing power together within the pool because for them, when you're mining Bitcoin, uh, the idea is that you need to have or a bigger size of hash rate contributing to solve the mathematical equation in order for you to get rewarded. So the more the hash rate you're contributing to a pool, the more the reward is split between everyone's contribution. So it's kind of democratizing the process of reward in a sense. I'm trying to put it in a simple form, but there's also the technical needs behind it because it's also very difficult for you to keep it always on uptime. Being part of the pool is the responsibility of the pool to do that as well. But that's kind of a nutshell, if it makes sense. Is there any other questions on the chat? When to buy crypto? Everyone wants to ask that question. It's always a good time to buy. And no, having said that, look, I'm just gonna talk about Bitcoin. I can't talk about crypto because uh, as I was saying previously, there are about 11,000 projects out there. Uh, and before I jump into this, and just when I was talking about circulating supply of Bitcoin, if we know that Bitcoin will only have 21 million coins ever produced or mined, does that mean over a period of time from here, 120 years, will the price go up? It's been happening, you know, since the last 10 years, from $0 to almost $64,000, maybe even to $100,000 this year, who knows? but that will still continue to go up because it is of limited supply. As long as it is still there in the market, of course, which no one can control it, and because of the limited supply, it will go up. However, from another perspective of cryptos generally, it's very difficult to say that this is the same with other projects. So if I take example, uh, a project such as, I'm just trying to find a random, 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 Tron, for, Tron example. Uh, I think they have an open supply. 
so if you guys go look at Tron, for example, I'm not sure what's the usability of this token or project. Of course, you can download the white paper and see it, but I know that the circulating supply is at the moment now 71 billion, but it doesn't have a max supply on it. Does it mean that this project can always produce more tokens? Yes. Will the value always remain up? Not necessarily. But it's a basic economics of supply and demand. If a project has value, has, has usability and is valuable, over a period of time, yes, the prices will always get appreciated. Is there any other questions on the channel? Uh, globally, there are a lot of entities that have started accepting Bitcoin for payment. The biggest one is PayPal. If you guys have not seen that, I have a friend now who just joined crypto PayPal in the US. So they are working on this. However, the biggest challenge for the crypto space is the regulation. And when I say the biggest challenge is because every country looks Bitcoin or crypto differently from one another. Please, next question. Oh, sorry. I, I um, apologize for the guys on the streaming. I, I keep on dropping my mic. But uh, any other questions from the chat over there? All right. So can you hear me? Is the mic working? OK. Uh, you mentioned the time that we predict Bitcoin to be fully mined to reach that 21 million is 2141. Is that uh, a theoretical limit, or is that just a technical limitation from our hardware? from our computing power. It is a technical limitation from the current hardware. Of course, the concept of supercomputing is there and people are talking about it, but till it realizes it's going to take some time. So it's a bit difficult. But uh, I think there's even a, a countdown. If, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I can find that for you guys. It's called the, the Bitcoin, sorry. Uh, so this is oh sorry yeah, let me, this is called the Bitcoin clock reward halving. It tells you when every time the next halving will happen. So the next halving is estimated to be on the 13th of May, 2024. So that will be the time on when we're going to be. Predictably monetary supply means that the price of Bitcoin, uh, or at least the inflation aspect of it, will increase over time as long as the uh, deflation rate or so will be increased over time. So, sorry, the, the, it's the, as long as the inflation rate is increasing over time, Bitcoin will become more deflationary over time. And this gives you an understanding on, on the time periods. But if I'm not mistaking, yeah, so this is one chart I would like to show you guys. What does this mean? It means that every time Bitcoin does a halving, which it breaks the diff or increases the difficulty rate for miners, the prices of Bitcoin always increases up. So in the first halving in about 2023, and you guys can see the similarities with the network difficulty, we had a push of price from a little bit over, let me give you guys a number, so a little bit over $10 all the way till $140 or even more probably, $600. And then we had the second halving, which went from about 600 all the way till uh, about 20,000 at least. And now we are on the third halving. I think this price is a little bit outdated. It's uh, June 2020. So this is about last year. And we've already reached, I think, about $60,000 this year. But are we still at the top of the halving? Not yet, which means that there's still a very big upcoming on the price, it could reach a little bit over 100,000. Disclaimer, this is not financial advice, but again, just a technical terminology. Any questions on that? The crowd is pretty quiet today. There's a chat. Uh, so the central bank came up with the guidance about a few weeks ago where they're looking to study to create their own CBDs, so central bank digital coins in 2023 to 2026. That's the area of where they're looking at it. And the concept is not about creating another currency, but rather having the ability to switch conventional dirham with the usability of blockchain technology. And this is where it's going to revolutionize uh, the concept of how we use money today in our economy, rather than having, you know, 
a transfer of bank taking one day for the same bank account or next day to transfer, it can happen instantaneously. And this is what the UA is trying to achieve. So it's going to bring a lot of added value benefit as well as facilitate uh, accounting processes such as reconciliation and audits. So it's just a matter of time for a lot of countries globally to have the ability to have their own CBTs. And I think Canada uh, are, have one in test phase and then China have uh, recently uh, issued their uh, uh, CBDs on that. But then again, these are great resources to look at. Uh, that being said, a lot of the projects that are on coin market cap again are very different. Not all of them represent the same concepts of Bitcoin, but it's very important to always do your due diligence. And when I say a lot of these projects are scams, uh, they are. So don't, don't go invest on random projects. I mean, if I can write, um, for example, uh, this project called Baby Cake, which is zero point zero 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 six dollars. Uh, would you invest in something called baby cake, for example? Not really, right? Because it doesn't bring any economic or utility value. Uh, if I do an example, like say Trump coin, I think there's a Trump coin, by the way. Somebody made it as a joke a few years ago. Um, uh, Trump coin, again, you're not going to invest in this because you know that it doesn't have any uh, us usability, correct? Uh, but it's a funny thing, actually, I might show you guys. A few years ago, now, problem, this is streaming on YouTube, so I would, how many people do you have on YouTube? 100, all right, so I hope these 100 people on YouTube do not uh, share this information with everyone, but let me see if I can find it. Uh, in 2017, uh, in 2017, when it was the ICO season, uh, a couple of uh, people I know created this website. Now, the website is called uh, the Useless Ethereum Token. It was a parody joke because we wanted to prove something that how people would not do their due diligence or read anything but still put their money into scammy projects. And we did this very website saying, literally, you're giving, you're going to give some random person on the internet money and they're going to take it and go buy stuff with it. Probably electronics, to be honest. And maybe even a big plasma screen TV. Seriously, don't buy these tokens. So this was like an awareness program, right? And the funny part is that we even did an FAQ to see if that people are going to be reading anything on this website. And this is really the old days. Is this a joke or is it a scam? We even said neither. This is real and it's 100% transparent. You're literally giving your money to someone on the internet and getting completely useless tokens in return. Uh, there's no white papers, no products, no experts, nothing. Uh, why are you doing this? Who knows? Maybe it's because I lost my money in the GDS flash crash and I got inspired. No, we were being very funny about it. And we even went to this point saying, how do I get a refund for the tokens I bought? You're kidding, right? So we did this. And again, this is a 100% useless token on the website. Guess how much people have invested in this project and actually bought the token? No, nobody did because it says on the, on the, on the website uh, that you are not going to get anything out of it in, in, in return. And if I'm not, not mistaken, we wrote it at the point. Or yeah, I guess we removed it. I need to double check. But at the point, it was almost, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, let me take this on the scan. I don't know if it's going to operate, but back in the days, if I'm not mistaken, at least uh, someone uh, was able to contribute almost four or five Ethereums on it. So it shows that people, three million UTs, so yeah, the equivalent of Sorry, let me take you guys back. So about six, 16 Ethereum. We, we created this website literally and it was saying to people, this is purely uh, a useless token. There's nothing to do with it at all whatsoever. And people were able still to give away 16 uh, Ethereum tokens to this. But chose the idea on, 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 on research and due diligence by people. It felt that. So this is a more uh, basic question, I guess. For someone first getting into Bitcoin, what are the different ways that you can actually 
store your Bitcoin. You know, when you have cash, you keep it in your wallet to keep it in safe, whatever. And what are the different ways to trade Bitcoin? So this is a good question. Um, of course, this is a long discussion, but I think I'm, I have a link. I might try to email it to you guys that we did uh, a previous session with us about an hour on YouTube. Uh, the best way is always to store it, of course, in a hard world. Never store your coins or, co pro or Bitcoins on an exchange because the chances of them getting hacked and losing your money is very high. For those who don't know the Madgox story, uh, back in 2014, 2013, it was one of the biggest exchanges in Japan got hacked and a lot of people lost their Bitcoins. And I think at the time, I had about 80 Bitcoins there and they're all gone. If only I had them today, I would have been a richer person. Uh, that being said, we learn from the mistakes and of course you can consider it a very expensive mistake. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. I no longer personally do that. Uh, having said that, please. As um, more people invest in Bitcoin and Ethereum, do you think in the future, as fewer are able to get mined with the increasing network difficulty, do you think the market dominance for these two currencies are going to widen the gap between them and the other currencies? And do you think it's going to be harder to actually create a new cryptocurrency? You asked a, you asked a very good question. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum will remain the dominant, like gold and silver, because they're the first comers that came out there. Bitcoin is the benchmark for a lot of these projects to follow. And a lot of these other projects use Ethereum as their network. So for now, at least, they're still there. They're still going to be used for the long term. Will they be used as a currency? I don't think so. Personally, I don't think Ethereum or Bitcoin will ever be used as a currency necessarily. But uh, as a, a uh, project, uh, as a reserve, probably as an asset, yes. That will continue. I think there's another question. The Bitcoin. Uh, how many, uh, I mean, the one dirhams is 100 fills. The Bitcoin, how many? So one Bitcoin is one of a 7 million Satoshis. And when we're going to reach to 21 million Bitcoins, and when the value of Bitcoin reaches, let's say, $1 million, nobody will be talking Bitcoin as a whole. They'll be talking in Satoshis. So that conversation will be switched. And I think it's going to happen in a few years where... Bitcoin will reach a large amount of sum and people say, okay, we're not going to talk about Bitcoin value, we're going to talk about Satoshi value. So that's going to eventually happen as we're going up with inflation over a period of time. So Satoshi is the smallest, uh, uh, let's say, decimal breakdown of the Bitcoin. So let's say if I have the dirham, one dirham is 100 fills. A dollar is 100 cents. A Bitcoin is a millionth of a Satoshi. So that's the concept of how it's going to develop. Seven uh, numeral digits. The like Satoshi eventually becomes a dollar. Imagine Bitcoin becomes one million dollars. And I lost 80 Bitcoins one day. It hurts. <laughs> Any other questions? On the chat? Can the Bitcoin crash in terms of price or crash as a technology? As a technology, no. Uh, unless if you create... Crash over? Uh, Bitcoin does not necessarily crash in terms of technology, but in terms of value against the dollar? Yes, if one, someone wants to compare it to the dollar. But if you're comparing Bitcoin to other cryptos, for example, not necessarily that's the case. So it depends the comparison around it. But nothing can ever necessarily crash as they get destroyed. The question is how do you value it over a period of time? So that would be probably the right uh, answer. Again, just to mention a few, one more thing. Uh, I just want to share another resource. It's called behindmlm.com. Uh, this is one of the good websites to keep in mind before investing on a project, just to make sure that if you're investing in a project, you're sure that these are not scams. So it gives you a good benchmark and research to know that. Again, when you look in coin market uh, cap as, as a resource. So again, just giving out that there. What was the other question? Sorry. Yeah, um, I remember I read a headline that uh, the value of Bitcoin decreased after Elon Musk refused to use it for 
one of his business operations. So how much do um how much are these currencies affected by how celebrities and businessmen use them? Elon Musk is a very exceptional case. Um the reason I'm saying this because Everybody knows that Elon likes to put the pump and dump, but even maybe he market reacted to that negatively, or maybe it was the right timing. Because in the end of the day, a lot of people look at charts and try to understand price and demand and supply to be able to make predictions on future prices. That being said, even Elon Musk last few days came up with concepts on saying, okay, we want to accept Bitcoin again. We want to take it to the market and we want to do all of this. And still, they were not able to push the price up back to the high highs. So it really comes down under the economics model. Do really influencers can social the price influence the price a lot? I'm not sure 100% if that's the case yet. Any other questions? Uh, that's a good question. We can find out. We can find out because all the information is public so if we're looking at uh has distribution blog details no average world i'm looking for uh should be here exchange rate volume market supply let's see if this is going to open so if I want to do the last 30 days, okay, it's not going to give me it this way. I think it won't give me, the, I don't think it will give me the small numbers, but it should be here if I can get it. It's only going to give me the overall. Okay. Usually on this chart depends on the, on the, on the charts, but let me see if I can find another one just to answer your questions. Number of Bitcoins. No transaction, Bitcoin mines revenue. Okay, this should work. So uh, this is the value I wanted in Bitcoin. Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin is risen. They're giving it in dollar value. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a very quick example. But let's say August 4, we had 33 million uh, Bitcoin Bitcoins produced. So if I do a very quick average divided by the average price of 38, I think it was, as of last day. We had about 868 Bitcoins produced yesterday, for example, globally, as part of the network. So all of that numbers are going to slow down as an increase over a period of time. Huh? No, only 868 globally ever produced yesterday. So this gives you an interactive chart. Unfortunately, it's Bitcoin minus revenue per day. It should be Bitcoin. Uh, as value, but again, this shows you an example of it. Is there questions on the chart, on the chat? If I knew that answer, I would be a very, very, very rich person today. <laughs> That's a very good question. So one of the challenges for governments, why they're not able to accept it, is economies work around government's currency, right? So GDPs are based on the value of the economic size of the country. If, for example, countries start accepting Bitcoin as a payment, uh, it will become very difficult for them to uh, equate that value into their economic models. So not all countries are necessarily uh, accepting bitcoin but again keep in mind this is an important statistic statistic 56 percent of the world is still unbanked so they don't have bank accounts so for a country like el salvador which accepted bitcoin as a payment currency it was an easier solution for them uh, than to uh, accept uh, sorry than to be uh, to rely on uh, on, on banks to provide them banking accounts. And I think there's a very good uh, chart rate for that. So 
unbind. In the world. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So keep in mind, uh, there's still a huge population or very big population. Of, so about 2.5 billion, and this is what the study from 20, no, so it's probably more now. So 3.5 billion people of the world still don't have access to bank accounts. But about everyone in the world has an access to what? Everybody has a mobile phone. So it's easier for them to bring the banking system into their mobile phones uh, than to set up a, bi uh, a banking infrastructure in countries. So then we have smaller projects that maybe not necessarily use Bitcoin, but are eventually using also what we call stable coins to move money around for trades. So again, that is being changed. So is really Bitcoin an investment product only for people, or is it really a financial economic solution or a financial system to solve Satoshi Nakamoto's first problem, which was why we rely on banks. So that's the concept that we wanted to, or that's the concept that Satoshi Nakamoto wanted to bring at least. Any other questions? It's very quiet. If you could only give microphones to the people on YouTube, right? Me? Uh, I've built some wealth over it. I've built some wealth over it over time. I wouldn't want to disclose that publicly over the internet. Not for someone to come and kill me, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I still have a very big passion for the concepts of crypto assets and, and cryptocurrencies generally. Fadal. So to run the computers, uh, to mine Bitcoin or to process these transactions, uh, costs a lot of power, which in turn has an effect uh, on the environment. On the environment. How do you think um, sort of government, as governments push for more sustainability and more environmental regulations, how do you think that'll impact uh, the mining sector or sort of cryptocurrency mining or even just the development of mining hardware? Do you work for Elon Musk? No. Are you a secret employee of Elon Musk? No. Did he pay you for to ask this question? All right. <laughs> I wish they did. I wish he did. Uh, just to give you an example, um, Elon Musk really discussed this previously, and that was his argument for Bitcoin being unsustainable. But there are many mechanisms that is being... So, sorry to interrupt you. Let me correct. It's not just for Bitcoin, but even new technologies like NFT, any cryptocurrency that relies on that. So not all cryptos work on proof of work, which is a concept of mining. A lot of them still work on proof of stake, which is basically staking the amount of coins to keep the network up and running. Example, the uh, argument behind the Ethereum upgrade to ETH 2.0. That being said, uh, the argument behind Bitcoin mining is that it's consuming a lot of electricity and energy, but people are saying that at least 60 or 70 percent of that energy anyways is coming from renewable energies so if they can satisfy that then it should be fine but in the end of the day the same argument can be said for data centers the entire internet and companies and oracles work on data centers and they are also very big in terms of consuming energy so it's not that argument isn't exclusively just for the miners of bitcoin industry that they are power hungry I mean, probably Facebook uses the most, or Google or Amazon Web Services uses more electricity than the whole community of Bitcoin together in terms of mining. So the validity of that argument doesn't really, really hold in terms of energy consumption. Uh, I know we're reaching... Sorry, go ahead. But fair enough, thank you. Thank you. I know we're reaching one o'clock. Is there any other... Yes, sorry, okay. But... Um, so you have a lot of knowledge in cryptocurrency. I was wondering, um, is it since you work for Device Police, is this involved in any of like the job that you have to do? Is uh, it part of it? So I'm managing a section called the Virtual Assets Crime Section. So uh, it has a, a lot of my job has to do with crypto from a day to day, and uh, not only from a research perspective, but I mean, look, I was saying this earlier today. 
a lot of criminals generally are the first adopters of new technologies. Anything that comes out new, whether they're crypto, 3D printing machines, or uh, drones, they're the first people that love to use the technology. And for me, from a person individually, I like to know how these criminals use these technologies. Not for them to commit the crime, but for the, in order for us to have the ability to protect people from their potential future crimes. That being said, one part of it is crypto. Why? Because it brings an interesting aspect on how people use crypto for what we call a black economy or parallel black economy, where they're trying to use, you know, uh, Bitcoin or other stable coins to sell drugs or to, to commit cyber fraud or ransomware. So it kind of depends on, on which uh, crimes they're being or trying to use for. So that's my day-to-day -day job. And this is why I look into crypto a lot and I do a lot of research into crypto generally. So have you, have you ever like caught a group that is like of doing course, that kind of doing but I can't share a little bit of discussion in a public uh, uh, space but I'm more than happy to to share that if you guys want or are interested to know more I think there's an article on Khalij Times so if you guys google Dubai Police Crypto or Digital Assets you might find an interesting article because this is just public information over there thank you um do you think infrastructure for physical servers and databases run by Google, Facebook, do you think the actual architecture of such infrastructures change to lower the impact on the environment? And do you think they'll ever be able to rent warehouse space and such facilities to everyday individual miners who can't afford to buy the equipment, but they'd like to take part in a, for a certain period of time? So for the first question, of course, technology always develops to consume less electricity. And I give the example of ACs or fridges. Back in the days, you know, the ACs were big, they were heavy, they were electric and something. And of course, now they're building them to become more and more efficient. So of course, over a period of time, technology tends to become overall more efficient and easier to use. That being said, I used to mine example Bitcoin at home when it made economic sense. Today, it's very difficult for me to do it because of economies of scale. In order for me to become profitable in terms of being able to mine Bitcoin, I need to have a very large infrastructure in order to do that. So again, it is a bit of a challenge, but uh, people can do it. I know a lot of people are doing it globally, not necessarily in the UAE, if they have the money and the investment to do it. And of course they will, uh, because it takes a lot of patience for you to actually seize your fruits of rewards. So as you probably know, we're currently in a global chip shortage. And you know, <laughs> we're- You're asking the right questions. More, yeah. more and more difficult to get computer hardware uh, to build these miners or to build any, any high computing power. Uh, how does that impact the trajectory of Bitcoin mining or the trajectory of uh, data centers as we probably need more and more computing power to make it profitable. We are, for the first time, that's true, on the, on the shortage of microchips globally. Even cars productions have been delayed, by the way, because of that uh, globally. But again, it's a question of supply and demand, right? So if you have companies that are coming up with more production, then again, that should meet their supply and demand. Just for an information, by the way, guys, for those that are UA nationals or that are based in Dubai, the biggest company or one of the world's biggest companies to manufacture chips is a company called Global Foundiers. They're U.S. Singaporean-based companies, and it is 100% owned by Mubadala. Uh, we have one of the we own as the UAE one of the biggest manufacturers in the world. The second one is I think Taiwan Semiconductors Production, which is based in Taiwan. So these are the two big players around the world. Uh, that produces uh, chips for electronics, vehicles, cars, and any uh, electrical uh, uses or appliances. Interesting information, by the way. Any other questions from the chats? We can't stop humans doing <laughs> what they want to do. It's very difficult to, to, to judge or stop uh, humans' actions. But again, it's everyone's individual choices, as long as they are within the legal aspects of it. So to be very fair in terms of that answer.
How much does it run to run Bitcoin? I guess maybe they're talking about the mining or equipment. I'm not sure. Is there any other questions? Yes, yeah, sorry. Just to sum up the discussion, because I'm within the one hour window. Um, some pyramid schemes um, that have been um, proven in the past have actually used their own tokens. And they say that you can pay us money and we'll give you tokens to be able to purchase stuff off our website. So for people who don't know much about cryptocurrencies and they somehow think that it's a cryptocurrency instead of a, a obvious pyramid scheme how would they go about trying to avoid that so this is why it's always good to have your own due, due diligence and research again one of the websites i was sharing earlier it's called behind mlm.com uh, you can find a lot of these pyramid schemes this is like driven by the public community so it's purely peer-to-peer -peer, and it shows all the projects that are related to Bitcoin scams or pyramid schemes or whatever it is uh, in in those areas. And I mean, this is, again, publicly driven. It's not owned by any government or any community. Anytime that somebody falls for a fraud, they publicly share it on this website. So it's an interesting idea to review and to research about generally. Uh, again, for more research, usually. But again, always be careful where you put your money. Never put more with, more than what you can afford to lose. And that's very important. Is there any other questions? If not, should we sum it up within the one hour window? Answered, yes. If that's it, I hope you guys have, because uh, I'm just going to maybe stay here around for asking questions offline, but I hope at least you guys get an idea of the basic understanding or the theory that's behind Bitcoin. Of course, this I can go much and much and much and much more about it, but I don't want to bore you guys to death with it unless if someone's really un interested technically to do that. Uh, again, there's a lot of courses available on the UAAI camp. <laughs>